All right, so welcome to our brief lecture and looking at where our city is located and also um, why in those areas. The slides are designed to accompany the textbook, people, places, and culture, and I'm of course Ms. Gall, and I'll be your host for the lecture. So when we talk about um, where city is located on the map, really there's three key ideas that we need to talk about. We need to talk about population, we need to talk about trade areas, and we need to talk about distance. Okay, and we'll talk about each of those a little bit in turn and what influence it has in terms of where we see cities located on the landscape. Okay. Uh, population is pretty self-explanatory. It's literally the number of people that live in an area. Trade areas are um, regions that are adjacent to, which is another way of saying next to, cities or towns where the influence of that city or that town is dominant. So um, every city or town has a trade area. And then when we look at distance, really a big piece of what we're talking about is how do those trade areas overlap or do they overlap? And what does that mean in terms of how far apart cities of various sizes can be? Oh, shoot. Oh, sorry about that. So we look at our map of the U.S. here, and we've got um, all these different colors and things. A big piece of what we're looking at are the trade areas of various cities and towns. So you can see, for instance, if we look at Washington State, Seattle, which is in the yellow, has a trade area that covers almost two-thirds of Washington State, dips down a little bit into uh, northern Oregon. Spokane, which is the blue, has a trade area that includes actually parts of three different states, which if you know that geography, you know kind of intuitively. The Tri-Cities, which is the green one in between them, has a much smaller trade area, but um, influential nonetheless. Okay. And we could do this for other states, I'm doing Washington, obviously, because we live here, but you can kind of look and see in each state there's one or two, maybe three cities that really kind of predominate and have trade areas that cover large parts of the state. So the next thing we need to talk about is the rank size rule. Um, and really this comes out of the work of a German named Felix Auerbach, and a linguist named, named George Zip, sorry. You don't need to remember those names. You do need to know rank size rule. Okay, and the rank size rule holds that in a model urban hierarchy, so if we take the cities in a country and we stack them, or we, we sorry, classify them based on population, okay, the um, Population, the approximate population of a city or a town will be inversely proportional to its rank in the hierarchy. We do that wearing our math hat. Let me explain to you what this means in, um, in English. So here in the United States, for example, New York City is the biggest city. The next biggest, if you stop and think about it, is LA. So since LA is number two in the hierarchy, when you look at its population, since the U.S. does actually follow the rank size rule, what you'll find is that the population of L.A. is approximately one half, one over two, of the population of New York. The third largest city, which I'm not positive might be Chicago, then would have a population of one over three of the population of New York, one third of the population of New York. And when I say approximately, I mean just that means that if New York is a population of 500 million people, LA's population is going to be 250 plus or minus. So it could be 235 million, or it could be 260 million. It's not an exact proportion, it's an approximate proportion. And the reason why this works is a combination of random chance and also economies of scale, right? which is to say efficiencies. Um, and so cities kind of get spread out in certain ways. Okay. But here's the important thing to note. The rank size rule doesn't apply in every country. So it works really well mostly in more developed countries. But there, there's another way of categorizing 
um, cities in the country, which is to say the primate city idea. The idea behind a primate city is that you've got one city whose population is so large, so disproportionately large, that it becomes exceptionally expressive of national capacity or feeling. Okay. Um, the classic example of this, the great example, is um, Paris, France. So when you think of France, what you tend to think of is Paris. Right? You don't think of, I think, the second biggest city, if I remember correctly, is Marseille. You don't think of Marseille. You don't think of any of the other cities around there because the population of Paris is so large and its position in terms of the economic capacity, in terms of the cultural capacity, is so disproportionately influential that that's what you think of when you think of that country. And so countries either follow the rank size rule or they follow a primate city rule. And there are other examples I could give you of the primate city rule, um, especially when we're talking about our less developed countries. But Paris is, is a great example to kind of think of and keep in mind. Um, Mexico City would be another example. Sao Paulo and Brazil would be another example. Okay, so now we've got some idea in terms of if we're ordering cities or trying to kind of place them in a hierarchy, where would they fall? Now what we need to do is look to see where approximately, give or take, would we find these cities on the landscape. And to do that, what we usually use is what's called central place theory. Okay, and central place theory is created by a guy named Walter Christaller. And you do need to recognize Chris Dollar's name, you need to recognize central place theory, and you need to have him associated in your brain. Okay. Five basic assumptions that he uses for his theory. Okay. First of all, that the region is flat and there's no physical barriers. So there's no mountains, there's no rivers, um, nothing that's going to block people from going from one place to the other. Soil fertility is the same everywhere, so you could farm anywhere if you wanted to. Okay. That populations distributed, and also that purchasing power would be evenly distributed. So in other words, those populations all have equal access to the same same amount of money. Um, transportation is uniform, and you can and it's designed to allow direct travel from settlement to settlement, so you don't have to go a roundabout way. You can always go straight to the next place. Okay. Um, and then also that from any given place, a good or a service could be sold in all directions out to a certain distance. We call that distance a threshold. Okay. So a threshold for a, a good or a service. So when he drew out central place theory, what he ends up settling on are hexagons as being kind of the perfect shape because he doesn't want overlap which is what would happen if we did circles and he wants it to be approximately the same from uh same distance outward from the center which means we can't do squares so he settles on hexagons and when you look at central place theory drawn out you should probably try and sketch this in your model or in your notes what you'll notice is that each size city has different size hexagons. Okay? So the big hexagons are big cities. They have large trade areas. Okay? The smaller and smaller hexagons, smaller and smaller cities. So he's using in this case cities, towns, hamlets, and villages. Okay? So T is town, V is village, H is hamlet. Hamlets are smaller than villages. Um, but each of those has its own um, exclusive trade area, right? And in that trade area, the city, town, village, hamlet, whatever we're looking at, has a monopoly on the sale of certain types of goods. Okay. Um, perfectly fitted hexagons again works because what we don't want is overlap. It's got to be an exclusive trade area, meaning that um, there's no place that's equally close that would then would then serve that except on those borderlands. So 
when we're looking at this, and again, that's it's an approximation. It's like any model. You know, we could lay it over a map, and we could find that it works somewhat well. Um, as we move further and further in time away from when it's created, it becomes a little bit less relevant, partially because it's not adapted to current circumstances, right? So we've got new factors, new forces, new conditions that he could never have even dreamed about when he's coming up with this model that makes it significantly less relevant. So for example, um, and this is the example they use in the book, is the Sunbelt phenomenon. In other words, the, million, the movement of millions of Americans from northern and northeastern states sat to the south and southwest has significantly shifted the size of cities and their impact. For example, people moving out of, say, uh, Detroit. Detroit, land-wise, is the same city it always was, but when you look at the population and you look at the city itself, what you'll notice is that large swaths of the city have been essentially abandoned and have all these deteriorating properties because the population has gone down so much. So that then creates some problems in terms of, you know, central place and how influential is Detroit and, you know, does the city move up or down in the urban hierarchy. So it does make it a little more interesting in that sense. So just to review and recap, we talked about um, a little bit about where we find cities and why. We talked about the rank size rule, which is just a way of saying that if you were to put all the cities in a country in a table based on their population and order them based on population, a city's place in the table, their population, should be approximately the inverse of their place on the table when compared to the largest city. So, for example, right, the second largest city should have a population that's half the largest city. The third largest city would have a population that's one third the largest city. The fourth largest city, their population is approximately one fourth the population of the largest city. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and we also talk about the primate city phenomenon, which is where you've got one city that's so large that it literally dominates the country's economic and cultural life. Its um, influence is hugely outsized and disproportional. We then went on to talk a little bit about central place theory, we talked about some of its underlying um, underlying ideas, right? The assumptions that, that Chris Stoller made when he put it in place, and we talked a little bit about a diagram, what it looks like if we see it on the map, and that's those interlocking hexagons, okay, that we see all. Um, we talked about how each city, village, town, or hamlet uh, has its own exclusive trade area, and as a that, and they don't overlap, and that's how we end up with hexagons. <clears throat> okay. And then we ended by talking about why central place theory is not as relevant today. So if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Please feel free to bring them into class, and I'll see you the next time we meet.